it's been a while since we had a new coffee grinder launch, right? I mean, when was the last one? I think it was around three hours and 47 minutes ago. I mean, does the world really need another coffee grinder? Probably not. Yet here we are. But... As always, before we get started, Time Mode did send us this grinder for free in exchange for our honest thoughts. No money exchanged hands, they had no say in what we put in this video, and they don't get to watch it before any of you do. We also have to thank Benki Brewing Tools for being amazing and helping with all of the logistics. If you're in India and you're looking to buy coffee gear, then definitely check them out, the link is in the description below. Okay, so Time Mode is a pretty popular brand in coffee. They make everything from brewers to kettles and some really popular hand grinders. But this is their first ever electric grinder. Well, grinders. There are four variants, the 64 and 78S, which are espresso slash all-round grinders, and the 64 and 78, which are brew only. Today, we'll be taking an in-depth look at the 078. We've spent the last few weeks really putting it through its paces, Aramse style, and we're excited to share our thoughts. Let's kickstart things by getting superficial. This is a really pretty grinder. And for the specs that it boasts, the footprint is surprisingly small. It is tall at around 30 centimeters, but doesn't look bulky at all. The design is sleek and clean with next to no sharp edges. It's almost like Braun designed it, and I think it's gorgeous. Unfortunately, I made the rookie mistake of opening Reddit, that warm and loving community. Not something I do very often, but I stumbled on this comment that said it looks like a sewing machine, and now I can't unsee it. So obviously I had to share it with all of you. You can thank me in the comments below. Anyway, it's the prettiest sewing machine I've seen. So let's zoom in and look at the details for a second. There's a nice texture to the surface and pretty much everything you touch except the hopper and the lid are metal. It's monochromatic except for this little splash of bright red, which is the grind size indicator. And I really dig that. It draws you in and the horizontal rail is a nice design element that guides your eye from the front all the way to the back where we have this jet engine style vent. Stick around for the ASMR a little later on to hear if it sounds like one too. The pill-shaped extrusion that forms the stem is very interesting because it gives the illusion of being very slim yet offering more than adequate support. From certain angles, it almost looks like the top section is floating and that's a big reason why this grinder doesn't look bulky. The base is nice and sturdy and the more boxy form creates a very pleasing visual contrast to the rest of the elements. The satin finish on the grounds knocker and the start button add class and sophistication. And lastly, the hopper uses what I think is solid molded acrylic, which really warps and bends light in very interesting ways. The functionality of the hopper is a different story, but we'll get to that in a second. Overall, if you haven't figured this out already, I really dig how this thing looks. Now, I'm sure you've all seen products that look great on the shelf, but the moment you pick it up, it just feels cheap. That is not the case with this grinder. Weighing in at around eight kilos, it is a heavy machine that really adds to the premium feel. It's almost all metal and even the plastic seems very high quality. I mean, one would expect that considering the price, but we'll get to that in a bit. The fit and finish and the tolerances on this machine, both inside and out are excellent and it's been an absolute joy to use and interact with. Everything you touch right down to the RPM knob feels premium. Yes, it has variable RPM. Now, the research on what impact this has on grind distribution is still quite nascent, but as it stands, conical burrs absolutely benefit from lower RPMs and tend to produce less fines. With flats, it seems like the same general rule applies, but like with anything in coffee, have fun with it, experiment and see what works best for you. We have an interesting use case for this feature though, which we'll talk about in the workflow section, but I digress, so let's get back to talking about user experience. Okay, I am drenched in sweat and I think I'm gonna overheat and pass out because I'm recording this in the middle of summer in Mysore without the fan or the AC on. So if that doesn't warrant a sub to the channel, I don't know what does. So just click on that button and then you can keep watching. So I recently taught myself touch typing and even got my first mechanical keyboard. Well, technically second, the first one was garbage, so I ended up returning it. But the reason I bring this up is that it's made me a lot more aware of 
tactile experiences on everyday products that we use. And this grinder has excellent tactile experiences all around. Okay, that sounds a bit dodgy when you say it out loud, but it really elevates the UX. For starters, we have the on-off switch, which is nice and large and well positioned, and most importantly, feels really nice to operate. There's a good resistance and a cushion thump that lets you know it's been engaged. It's much nicer to use than say the switch on the EK43 or the Minio, or the small clicky button on the Ode. The niche switch is very nice and chunky, but I still think I prefer this. The grind adjustment on the brew version is very pleasant to use with a moderate to high stiffness and subtle dampened clicks. It's large and grippy and feels like it'll hold up very well over time. The S version that's more espresso focused is stepless. Here you have 18 primary clicks, each having one subdivision, so you have a total of 35 grind settings. You can go from French press and cold brew all the way down to mocha pot, but you cannot do espresso or Turkish. So definitely keep that in mind. Okay, so far we've gushed about this grinder quite hard and it's completely justified because it's got a lot going for it. But we do need to address some of the issues and pretty much all of my complaints are about the hopper. Similar to the old Gen 1, the slope is just not sufficient and it gets worse if you use RDT because the beans are now sticky. At least with the Ode, you can ditch the lid and push the beans in as the hopper empties. But with this, that's a bit of a challenge. And that brings me to the second issue, popcorning. It's pretty bad. I mean, I thought it was at the movies. This anti-popcorning disc, if that's what it's supposed to be, is less effective than the privacy settings on Facebook. I tend to prefer hot loading, which is basically dropping the beans in when the motor is running, and also like to slow feed the beans. This tends to produce fewer fines and yield a slightly better cup, but that's quite a pain to do with this grinder because shit's flying everywhere. They have tried to fix this with an interesting hopper lid design. It houses two magnets to give it some additional functionality. The obvious one is that the rear magnet secures it in place in the fully closed position. The second, more interesting one, is that you can lock it into a partially open position using the second magnet to be able to feed beans in without having bean shrapnel blind you. It's a bit of a hacky fix to a problem, but I'll take it. While it definitely doesn't eliminate the issue, it does mitigate it quite a bit. And lastly, the hopper capacity is also a tad low. It manages about 45 to 50 grams, which is fine, but it would have been nice to have the option to grind slightly larger batches on occasion. One workaround though is to keep it partially open and load the beans as the hopper empties, but there are two very important things to keep in mind when doing this. One, don't let the hopper get too empty before adding in more beans because popcorning. And two, make sure you place a larger catch cup below because the stock one will overflow. It isn't large enough. Okay, now that I've got that off my chest, let's get back to gushing. The grounds knocker. Brilliant. I am a bit obsessed with it. I think I might break it from overuse because I just can't seem to stop myself from clicking it. It's so satisfying to use and it actually works. It's always nice to see innovations like this that just make a product more enjoyable to use. Quality of life upgrades, if you will. It's so much nicer than the usual flicky type knockers. The catch cup is nice and hefty and I really love how it slides into place with this little wiggle. It always makes me smile and it's so satisfying. Even the sound is nice. I have noticed some scratches on the base, but I think it's always been there. The paint job looks really good, so I doubt it's the sliding of the catch cup that's caused it. Well, at least I hope not. Grounds do tend to cling to the inner surfaces a bit, and I believe the material is aluminium with some sort of sandblasting. I'd have preferred stainless steel, but I'm just nitpicking here. So let's move on and talk about sound a little more. Yes, sound is such an important aspect of so many of the products that we use every day and is usually subconscious for most people. All these little things add up to create a product experience. So let me cut to some B-roll and play the sound of the motor and then the sound of grinding coffee. Enjoy the ASMR and we'll chat on the other side. I don't know about you, but that has some jet engine vibes going for it and I'm digging it. Even when grinding, it's almost surgical, the sound, and it gives you a sense that it's a precision tool. It's also very quiet, especially when compared to the SSP burrs in the Ode. And while we're on the topic of sound, the Minio XL also has a lovely deep rumble. 
but I am going off on a tangent. So if anyone wants a dedicated grinder ASMR video, let me know in the comments below, but let's move on. Okay, the outside looks great. So what do you say we open this up and look at where the magic powder gets made? First, turn the dial all the way to the coarsest setting. This is optional, but it makes the next step a bit easier. Then just wiggle it off. It's held in place by a strong magnet. Unscrew this little nubbin that's used for calibration or setting the zero point. I'll show you how that's done in a second. Then unscrew the locating plate, which also has these indentations on the inside that allow for the step grind adjustments. Then carefully undo the six hex screws and pull out the external burr support plate. Once that's done, push in and twist using the little pull out handle and the outer burrs along with the carrier should come free. And inside we have the crazy turbo burrs. Okay, can we take a second to acknowledge retention or lack thereof? This grinder has less retention than my head does with hair. For more balding jokes at my expense, check this video out. To be honest, I was really skeptical when I first saw these burrs because it reminded me of Time Maw's last attempt at burr innovation. The S2Cs on their Chestnut X weren't great, but right after the first sip of the first brew with this grinder, both Namisha and I were cried a little. Tears of joy. I realized we were dealing with something a little special here, but we have a whole segment on taste, so you'll have to wait a little bit for that. Coming back to calibration, Timo have made it very simple by allowing you to place this little pin anywhere in the circumference in order to determine how close you want the burrs to be at the zero position. Depending on where you place it, it will strike these end stoppers at different points in the rotation. Straight out of the box, burr rub is at around three clicks beyond zero. You can adjust this if you really want to go a little bit finer. If, however, you find yourself not needing these finer settings, you can go in the opposite direction and have the burrs be further apart at zero position, which gives you more settings at the coarse end. And if you ever get lost and you want to reset to factory calibration, just use the nifty markings and have this zero marker line up with the red mark on the body and place the pin here. Okay, getting a little technical here, this grinder houses a brushless DC motor. This sounds boring as hell and probably is to most of you, but you'll be excited when I tell you why it matters. I'm not sure if you know how motors work, but if you're interested, then I've linked to a couple of really well-made videos in the description below. So basically the benefits are no friction other than at the bearings, so much longer life. It also means a more consistent delivery of torque, so you get better grind consistency. It has much better power to weight ratio, so you don't have a massive motor making the grinder bulky. And lastly, it's much quieter. So I can't use it like I do the SSPs in the ode to drown out my toddler's tantrums. Those SSPs can wake the dead. Okay. When it comes to RPM, I tend to stick to the lower settings, but what I like doing is almost mimicking the auto purge function on the much more expensive P100 grinder from Optiono. Basically, it spins up the motor towards the end of a grind to max RPM in order to dislodge any particles that are stuck to the burrs and further reduce retention. So with the sculptor, I manually ramp up to max RPM after the last few beans have been ground and quickly use the grounds knocker a few times before turning it off. This seems to get us the lowest retention. I'll admit it's a tad extra, but what can I say? I'm a lost cause. Anyway, now that we have ground coffee, there's only one thing left to do. Let's brew. So to keep this interesting, we thought it would be nice to pit it against the 64mm SSP multipurpose burrs that we have in the old Gen 1. The SSPs are hugely popular amongst people who enjoy very high clarity. This was a really interesting comparison and instead of just doing a blind cupping, we decided to have a little fun with it and Namisha and I brewed each other the same coffee every day over several days without revealing which grinder we were using and then compared notes. So here's what we found. Well, in a nutshell, the turbos are better. Okay, I should probably rephrase that. I like them more. Now, don't get me wrong, the SSPs are incredible but pretty unforgiving and I also find that they're pretty quick to pull astringency out of coffees. These turbos, on the other hand, while lower in clarity, produce much juicier, rounder, and more balanced cups, and they're so much more forgiving. It's really hard to brew a bad cup, and that just makes it very enjoyable to use. Sorry, the word plump pops in my head when I think of the brews that come out of the sculptor. Kind of like a fat synth with a pH, with some lovely harmonics sprinkled in, if I had to use a music analogy. It irons out any of the flaws or tucks them into places where they're no longer obnoxious. The SSPs, however, are harder to dial in and give it to you straight. 
The brews are sharper with more pronounced acidity and flavor delineation is definitely better. But the brews are a little thinner and more tea-like. The good, the bad and the ugly are all dialed up. So if your coffee isn't great, these aren't going to sugarcoat them like the turbos do. They are different beasts and both excellent in their own right. But I just find myself reaching for the turbos more of late. Maybe it's a novelty and I will yearn for more clarity and more delicate floral notes very soon. But for now, I'm really digging the succulent brews that are coming out of the 78. But is it worth it? Okay, let's talk price and who this is for before we wrap this one up. At 649 US dollars, this is not a cheap grinder and it's filter only. But given the features it sports, how it looks, and most importantly, the performance, we think the price is more than justified. So at the current price on Kickstarter of $499, it's just a no brainer if you're looking for a high end grinder to handle all of your filter coffee needs. And with the specs on this thing, I can see it doing really well in a cafe setting too. You'd have to spend a lot more money to see any significant improvements, both in terms of workflow and in the cup. And on that note, I think it's time we wrap this one up. There have been many popular grinders in the last few years, like the Niche and even the Weber Workshops Key, that were built around already existing good burr sets from manufacturers like Matzer. This is definitely a leg up because the foundation is so strong. You've essentially got an excellent heart that you then need to just build the organs around. Grinders like the Sculptor and the Ode are special because they've been built entirely from the ground up. Just hearing the process of developing and testing new burrs is enough to drive someone crazy. So I can only imagine how hard it must be to actually do it and get it right. So credit where it's due. When I first saw the Sculptor pop up on my feed, I really wasn't too excited. Yeah, I thought it looked cool, but I mean, there's a new grinder that comes out pretty much every week, so it's hard to stay excited. But after testing and using the time more for a few weeks now, I'd be really surprised if it doesn't become super popular. We hope to get our hands on the S model and even the 64mm ones to test soon. But as for the 078, while I'd love to see some improvements to the hopper in the next generation, it is an absolute banger of a grinder and even at MRP, is pretty much in a league of its own. But now we'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on the Sculptor? Are you considering buying it? And did we miss anything that you'd have liked us to talk about? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, thank you so much for hanging out and listening to me ramble on about a grinder. And until next time, grind Aramse.